In terms of alternate histories of the 20th century, I can honestly think of no bigger question than what if Mao Zedong had lost the Civil War and lost control of the mainland in 1949? The rise of the Chinese Communist Party has had huge impacts on the Cold War, the consumerism of the West, and let's be real, an almost inevitable World War III. But if we are to have a crack at this hypothetical question, we have to understand the man who would have made China into a different image. As we launch our new series on the characters of communist China, ironically today's video is going to be all about the anti-communist Chiang Kai-shek and ultimately the vision for China that he left behind. How different would China be today if they continued under his leadership rather than Mao Zedong's? Was he really all that big on democracy? Who was China's Generalissimo? Hello there. Now, I'm curious to know where you actually stand. Let me know below, are you team Mao or are you team Chiang? So Chiang Kai-shek was born into a peasant family in Zhikao, eastern China. However, his family owned a salt store, making them amongst the most wealthy in the village. His dad died when Chiang was seven and he married at just 14. Now, in terms of what's important, we're gonna to skip to 1905 where a 17 year old Chiang went to military school in Japan. For context, Japan was going through the Meiji Restoration. Basically, they had been in isolation for 250 years under the Tokugawa government, but when Commodore Matthew Perry forced them to open up in 1853, they modernized. And they modernized fast. And so in 1894, when Japan and China went to war over who got to run Korea, Japan won, displacing China as the dominant power in Asia. So Chang went to military school in Japan, knowing that that was where he could receive the most valuable education. But it was in Japan where Chang met a man by the name of Chen Chi Mi. Now, it was illegal for Chinese military students to form political groups while studying in Japan for pretty obvious reasons. We will not rest until we bring an end to the empire, until we restore our republic. Are you with me? But Chen Chi Mi introduced Chiang Kai-shek to the Tongmenghui. Basically, China was run by the Qing Dynasty, an ethnically Manchu group who were considered both incompetent and corrupt and were largely blamed for China's humiliation in the 1800s. And rather than Manchu, most of China is ethnically Han Chinese, and so the Tongmenghui's mission was simple, overthrow the Manchu Qing government. And the Tongmenghui was led by a guy named Sun Yat-sen. Now, that might be a name that you actually recognize, and we'll find out why in just a second. In late 1911, Chang received a telegram from his friend Mr. Chen, telling him to leave Japan and to join in a revolution that was taking place against the Manchus. And that's exactly what Chang did. Now, being militarily trained, Chang led a successful 100-man assault in the town of Hangzhou, which was not too far from where he was actually born. And Sun Yat-sen was leading the rebellion on three main principles. One, nationalism. China was to be controlled by all Chinese ethnicities and not the Manchus, and China was not to serve the interests of Japan and European powers, but the interests of China. China was to imitate the style of Western government seen in Europe, and three, welfare rights. The Chinese government was to play a role in supporting the livelihoods of ordinary Chinese people. Now, the rebellion was a huge success, but there was an issue. Turns out Sun Yat-sen was more of a big picture guy rather than a details guy, and once his government was in, he realized that he was in over his head. Look, I'm gonna be honest. Between you and me, I don't fully know what I'm doing, but it seems like you guys do, so I'm just gonna stay out of the way and give you guys whatever you need. So Sun passed the leadership onto a guy named Yuan Shikai, who was in no real rush to institute democracy. Chiang Kai-shek was put in charge of a revolutionary brigade and he went to see a rival within the movement who was in hospital. The two got in a heated argument and so Chiang just pulled the gun out and shot him dead. He was known for having quite a short temper. The Kuomintang, which was the name given to the leading party in the New Republic of China, was split into two groups. One, those who sided with the leader Yuan Shikai, and two, those who sided with the now unemployed Sun Yat-sen, who didn't like the direction that Yuan was taking the government, i.e. no democratic revolution. And so Chiang Kai-shek was definitely on the side of Sun Yat-sen, especially after Yuan Shikai ordered the assassination of his friend Chen Qi Mi. So Chiang joined Sun in Shanghai, and by this point, Yuan's rule was kind of tearing the country apart. A whole bunch of warlords claimed control over local areas in China, and they just simply didn't recognize the republic government. And so Sun Yat-sen came up with a plan to launch northwards with an invasion, and to reunify China under his rule, and to make the revolution actually work this time. And to do that, the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party formed an alliance called the United Front in 1924. Now, remember point three of Sun Yat-sen's three principles. The idea that the Kuomintang was to provide government welfare actually gave way to some ideological crossover and the two merged to defeat the warlords. With an alliance with the communists, Sun sent Chiang to communist Russia to learn. And while in Russia, Chiang spent three months studying the Soviet political and military systems and he even met Leon Trotsky. 
and so Chang returned to China with what would be his ace of spades. He formed the Wampo Military Academy that was based on the Soviet model. Now, in China's warlord era, everyone used mercenary soldiers all the time. But if Chang could train a generation of Southeast Chinese soldiers, the Kuomintang would have no dependence at all on these mercenary soldiers. Now, in 1925, Sun Yat-sen died, creating a bit of a power vacuum. And I said the military academy was Chang's ace of spades, and here's why. Chang wasn't really tipped to be the successor after Sun, but he used all of his trained soldiers to arrest Soviet troops and many operators from the communist wing of the United Front, including future Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai. The Canton coup effectively crippled the communists because it removed their Soviet support, and Chang gained support from the Kuomintang because his actions ensured that they would lead the United Front rather than the communists. On the 5th of June 1926, he was named Commander-in-Chief of the National Revolutionary Army, and Chang decided to go ahead with the Northern Expedition that Sun had loosely planned. Now, even though they had been purged from the leadership of the movement, the Chinese Communists helped the Kuomintang with the Northern Expedition, but this wouldn't last long. The Northern Expedition was remarkably successful in gaining control of Hunan and Wuhan, though Chang did have to use other warlords to help. But, in 1927, Chang declared martial law in the city of Shanghai, and basically he used martial law to purge the communists and if anyone spoke out against it, they were executed. Effectively, this had two consequences. One, the United Front was over. Gabe. What? We should break up. What? And two, the communists fled the cities and entered rural areas where it would be safer for them. But in all seriousness, Chang said this, I would rather mistakenly kill 1,000 innocent people than allow one communist to escape. He meant business. China would be run by nationalists rather than communist principles. And so Chang went on to take Beijing and was now internationally recognized as the leader of China. Now, he was given the title of Generalissimo, a title previously given to Sun Yat-sen, and basically Sun had an idea of what was called political tutelage, a temporary era in which China would be controlled by a military leader before it was ready for democracy. And so for Chiang Kai-shek, the solution was simple, just permanently be the military leader in charge of tutelage. And so with China now under his rule, the Nanjing Decade, the Chinese era from Chiang Kai-shek taking over in 1928 to the Nanjing Massacre in 1937, took place. And with stability for the first time since the beginning of the century, they modernized in many areas and built highways, factories, airlines, they saw increased students study at university, and their GDP growth averaged 3.9% throughout the 1930s. However, there were still rebellions such as the Fujian Rebellion in 1934, in which the province briefly set up its own government and then allied with the communists. And so Chang doubled down on his suppression of the communists. Knowing it was unsafe to stay in southern Jiangxi, Mao's communists marched 6,000 kilometers to Xianji on foot. But I'll save the long march for the Mao episode. But the 1930s also saw the issue of Japan. In 1931, Japan illegally occupied Chinese Manchuria, and then in 1937, they made further advances into China, taking Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, and then Nanjing. Now, while in Nanjing, China was to endure one of the worst genocides in the 20th century, and that's literally the century of genocides. Over 100,000 Chinese people were killed, and over 20,000 women, including some children and the elderly, were raped during the occupation. The Japanese soldiers went door to door seeking women out, and soldiers were competing with each other as to who could kill the most Chinese by sword. With China so badly massacred, a second united front formed between the communists and the Kuomintang. And in June of 1938, Chiang Kai-shek made a very controversial call, which let's face it, he got completely wrong. The Japanese were advancing along China's Yellow River, and Chang made the call to intentionally burst the river to wipe out the Japanese. It's estimated that 890,000 people died in the Yellow River flood, and a further 3 million more from the famine that came afterwards. The Japanese, well, they weren't really slowed down, and Chang had to relocate to Chongqing to wait until the Americans defeated the Japanese in the Pacific. While he was waiting though, he got the call up to attend really important Allied conferences like the Cairo Declaration. Japan was defeated in the Pacific, and they had to withdraw from China. So, China went back to being under Chang's control, right? Well, not quite. You see, the KMT and the Communists had gotten back together during the war. I got off the plane. So, it was tough to figure out who should control China. And long story short, they went to war over it. Now, you can find out why Chiang Kai-shek lost in these videos here, but here's my quick snapshot. Firstly, he ignored and defied American instructions which lost them resources and any chance of US soldiers intervening. 
Secondly, he promoted generals who were loyal to him, but were just incompetent. Thirdly, he allowed landlords to brutalize peasants, which made many KMT soldiers defect to the communists. Fourthly, KMT soldiers were treated terribly and many died on their marches. And then finally, Chiang had brutalized cities like Changchun, and so when Mao arrived, they were actually greeted as liberators. And so after remarkably losing the Chinese Civil War, Chiang fled to Taiwan and would continue to govern China from Taiwan. But this was a pretty interesting case. Taiwan was previously occupied by Japan, but they treated the Taiwanese nowhere near as badly as say the Filipinos or the Indonesians. And so the Taiwanese actually had a pretty positive perception of Japan. But when Chang arrived, he brutally cracked down on the Taiwanese. For example, there was the 228 incident in which KMT soldiers beat up an elderly woman on the street, and when the locals protested, they were shot down. For an entire month afterwards, soldiers were allowed to shoot demonstrators and there were rapes and decapitations, with 28,000 Taiwanese murdered. Now, a question I sometimes get asked is, did Chiang Kai-shek have any plans of reclaiming the mainland? And the answer is 100% yes. In the same way that Douglas MacArthur successfully reclaimed the Philippines, Chiang thought he could simply take the mainland back. A Taiwanese man even said this to National Geographic. The old leaders here were outsiders. To them, Taiwan was a hotel. They reckoned they were going back to the mainland, so they spent huge sums on the armed forces and next to nothing on roads, rails, and harbors. On the other side of the coin, did Mao want to take Taiwan? Well, almost certainly too, but Chiang was saved by the Korean War. After the war, the PRC claimed the small distant Tarkin Islands, and Taiwan and the United States signed a mutual defense treaty as part of America's domino theory. With the island now under his control, Chiang built a cult of personality. His portraits were everywhere and on everything from travel posters to digital clocks, and his image wasn't actually dropped from Taiwanese banknotes until 2000. The Kuomintang also refused to hold elections by insisting that the National Assembly represented all of China, and that new elections could not be held until the Kuomintang took over the mainland once again. Opponents of Chiang were targeted, with over 3,500 dissidents killed. The UN, however, regarded Chiang as the legitimate leader of China, and the Taiwanese government got the seat of China at the United Nations until 1971, when it reached a point where it just got ridiculous to pretend that the PRC wasn't the Chinese government. Chiang died a year before his arch nemesis Mao Zedong in 1975, and his son, Chiang Ching Kuo, took over. However, the new Chiang ended martial law and finally fulfilled Sun Yat-sen's second principle of a democratic China. Thanks for watching, it's great to kick off the new year with a longer video on a very interesting figure in Chinese history. If you enjoyed it, we've got plenty of other China content which you can check out here, and we can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.